John or Jack Zabrowski, Z-E-B-R-O-W-S-K-I. And I'm Roger Boren, and the last name is spelled B-O-R-E-N. All right, I have an audio level, so whenever you're ready, Justice Boren. So. All right. We're here in uh, my chambers at the Court of Appeal in Los Angeles with, uh, I'll call him Jack Zabrowski, mm -hmm. who uh, used to be my colleague here and is now a practitioner of the art of ADR in uh, Southern California especially, I guess. I'm going to ask you a little bit how far afield you, you roam on that. Um, uh, he was here about four years from what? Tell us the years you were here. I was here from uh, about mid-95 to late-99, so a little over four years. Right. As I see it, you, you left here in November of 99. Correct. And so it was at least four years, if right. not maybe a few days beyond that, but mm -hmm. about that. Uh, we're doing this as, uh, this interview as part of the Legacy Project. That project was started uh, at the court's uh, 100th anniversary, and all retired justices of the Court of Appeal, were, it was thought, would be interviewed, and we would uh, discuss with them their, their careers and especially their uh, uh, with a focus on the Court of Appeal service. And the idea would be that we'd have a legacy that is left behind of what has been going on in the Court of Appeal over the years and also as to the people who were the justices here. Uh, I've been told that uh, some of the uh, DVDs or the CDs or whatever of, of these interviews have been uh, glommed onto by law schools and other people. So mm. we perhaps need to be careful what we say. So let's uh, start by uh, just getting some kind of general framework. You, you're from the state of Pennsylvania? Uh, from western Pennsylvania, right. Oh, you're more specific than western Pennsylvania. Well, you know, what, Pennsylvania is a uh, state that was put together because of history, not because of uh, geographic consideration. So there's the Appalachian Mountains goes right through the center of it. So eastern Pennsylvania is a bit different than western Pennsylvania. But you went to university in eastern Pennsylvania, didn't you? Right. I, I, I grew up near Pittsburgh, but I went to school in Philadelphia. Okay. University of Pennsylvania? Right. Okay. And I, uh, without going, we don't need to go into the dates, but you're, you're about, what, 62 years old? That's right. Okay. Got that right. Um, where did you go to law school? Georgetown in Washington. And what year did you graduate from? 75. Okay. Did you practice anywhere before you came to California uh, law? Well, not exactly. I worked for the Department of Interior while I was in law school okay. doing legal work there, uh, but not as a lawyer, more as a legislative analyst. And then when I gra uh, graduated from Georgetown, I came out to California to begin practicing law. Well, what brought you to California? Well, I was looking uh, to practice in a large metropolitan area, and so I considered a number of them. I had some relatives that lived there, a couple of aunts and uncles and some cousins. And I looked at a couple of different places and decided Los Angeles looked pretty good to me at that time, and I came out. And apparently it was a good choice then for you, you think? Yeah, I think so. Los Angeles has been pretty good to me. California generally has been pretty good to me. Let, let, let me ask you a, a little thing that uh, maybe backs up into your career before you got to California, and that is you have a number of publications. Did you uh, publish anything either in law school as law review or anything else uh, prior to coming to California? Well, when I was on the uh, Law Journal, Georgetown they call it the Law Journal rather than Law Review for some reason, but when mm -hmm. I was on the Law Journal there, uh, every student had to write a note for the Law Journal. And uh, I had spent a good bit of time working in the uh, steel mills during my college years back around Pittsburgh. And when I was working in the steel mills was before the Occupational Safety and Health Act. And I saw a lot of people get hurt. No. <laughs> and the, they didn't have nearly the safeguards they should have had at that time. And early, might have been right before I started law school, right about the time I started law school, the Occupational Safety and Health Act was passed. So, uh, so that interested me because of my past experience in working in the mills. And so I wrote an article about the Occupational Safety and Health Act uh, shortly after it had been enacted and it was in its early years. And so that article ended up getting cited by the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission. It was an administrative uh, administrative court type of a agency and also a couple of times by some of the federal circuit courts. And I think it was primarily because the Occupational Safety and Health Act was so new that nobody had written anything about it. So when these issues started percolating up to the courts and to the re review commission, 
and they started looking for literature about it. My article was about all they were finding, so they would cite it. Well, would it be fair to say that uh, you're probably viewed as somebody who has a, a, some specialty in the law uh, with regard to business and things like related to that, like employment law or OSHA and other things like uh, th that nature? Well, I've always done business-related work primarily, uh, uh, contracts and insurance and real estate, that type of thing. And that's pretty much what I do now. W would you describe it, any one of those as m more special to you than any other area of business law related law? Well, I, uh, I wouldn't say that I'm highly specialized, but because I handle all types of business uh, matters uh, from, most business matters involve contracts of one kind or another, and sometimes they're corporate control disputes or partnership LLP control disputes, or I get a lot of insurance coverage, insurance uh, allocation and uh, equitable allocation types of issues. Here in, in Los Angeles, of course, we have a large entertainment industry, so you get a lot of entertainment cases, which are, most entertainment cases are basically contract cases. Sometimes they have a little bit of intellectual property overlay, but usually that's not a lot of what the issues are. They're usually contract cases, and I get all kinds of cases of that kind. I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, your practice of s civil law. Uh, how many years did you practice that in Los Angeles? I practiced uh, out here with for seven years before becoming a court commissioner. Okay, so about that long. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that was all of that basically in business-related areas? Yes. Okay. Right. And you became a commissioner right. of the Los Angeles Superior Court. Right. And that was in 19, uh, that was in uh, 80, 1982? Would that be about right? So uh, I have a note here that says December 1982. It was a yeah. It was right. It was either late 82 or early 83, right around there. And, and you you were a commissioner until October of 1986. Would that be about right? That sounds right. Okay. I, I was going to ask you as a commissioner, uh, did you uh, some of them were more general and some of them were rather had specific assignments. What what kind of assignments, assignment or assignments did you have as a commissioner? Well, when I started, uh, the first thing I started doing was trying jury trials. Mm -hmm. But I only did that for a short while before I got transferred into Law in Motion. This was back in the master calendar days when you had those large Law in Motion calendars all concentrated in a few departments up on the eighth floor. And so there was me and about four or five judges doing all the Law in Motion calendars. And so I did a Law in Motion calendar there most of the time that I was a commissioner. Okay. And. Uh, uh, at some point, you in well, it would have been October 8, 1986, you became a Superior Court judge. Right. Was that by appointment of a governor? Correct. And which governor was that? Governor Duke Major. Okay. So 1986, in October, you come to the, you're already there, but now you change your your nomenclature, so to speak, yeah, and well, you are a Superior Court judge. Well, how, how long did you practice as a Superior Court judge? Well, the first, uh, let's see, well, I was a Superior Court judge until about 95, I guess, until I got appointed to the Court of Appeal. And that would have been October of 95 then, I think. I believe so, months. right. Okay. Um, as a Superior Court judge, did you kind of stay in the same kind of law in motion uh, area that you'd been in before? Did you? Well, the first thing that happened was I, I, I got appointed, so I w walked from the eighth floor down to Department 1. And of course, they already knew it because they, they are advised. And so I walked in there, and so they, they swore me in, and they gave me a, another little little plaque to put on the uh, bench. And I just changed the plaque from one that said commissioner to one that said judge, and just went back and kept doing the same thing I'd been doing. In the same courtroom? <laughs> in the same courtroom, and just every, did everything the same for a month or two. Uh -huh. And then, this was back at the time when we had the the long, long delays until trial. Everything was taking five years to get to trial. Yeah. And nobody could get cases to trial anywhere. And for some reason, as far as I can tell, it's lost in political antiquity. There was a seven-story courthouse built down in Norwalk. Oh, yes. I'm not really sure why they built such a big courthouse down in Norwalk. It didn't seem like it was really needed. But for some reason, the seven-story courthouse was built in Norwalk. And so they had empty courtrooms there. And they had cases they just couldn't get to trial. So they sent me down to Norwalk, and then they just started sending me cases from all around the county. Probably less than half of them actually came from the Norwalk district. I would get cases from Santa Monica and Van Nuys and Long Beach and 
San Fernando and some from downtown, and they would just send them down there to try jury trials, and I just started trying jury trials one after another. Were, were these all civil or business, or would they include criminal? What, what was uh, well, the mix? well, they had me in a department that in, uh, in the Norwalk practice, it, it was called a general trial department, which meant basically you were handling civil cases. Mm -hmm. But if they needed you to, you'd try a criminal case. And once in a while, I'd try a family law case or even a probate case. But, but probably 80% of it was general civil cases and then a mixture of other things. Uh, it seems like uh, part of your activity as a Superior Court judge uh, may have included, I, I didn't catch the dates, but you also uh, worked as an adjunct professor of law for a period of time. I spent about, uh, well, well, it was an evening class, one class a year for about six or seven years at Loyola. I taught a class on what, what was called advanced civil procedure. So it was for students who had already gone through their first year of law school, maybe through their second year, but they'd already had basic civil procedure and tort law and contract law, and so they had all those basics. And then I would basically teach them how to actually handle a case in the L.A. Superior Court or in the, in the local federal court and teach them how the rules worked. and. If you had a certain fact pattern, what kind of a procedure would you look to use? And the idea was to make sure that they would at least know where to start when they confronted a problem when they were out in practice. Was there anything in particular that uh, caused you to uh, leave the civil practice in uh, private practice and enter into a judicial career? What, what attracted you that way? Well, I, uh, well, I was just thinking maybe attractive is not the right word, although it wasn't that it wasn't attractive, but that's just not how it happened. Well, <laughs> the way, well, the way, the way it happened that. was I had a, I had a, I worked for a client uh, a, a, uh, named USA Petroleum, which was a client that I worked for when I was in uh, private practice. And uh, w one of the older partners in the firm decided he was going to leave private practice and become the general counsel of USA Petroleum. So he did that, and he told me that uh, his deal was that since he was getting near retirement, he was supposed to find a younger guy to bring along to teach the business to, and then the younger guy within a few years would take over as general counsel of USA Petroleum. So it seemed like a very good opportunity. So I, I did that. And like sometimes happens in life, the economy didn't cooperate very much, and we had a number of problems there, and the, and the company started having financial difficulties, and we started trying to work out a merger in order to solve the financial difficulties. The uh, merger then lead, led to a big dispute, and lawsuits were filed over that. I was actually personally named as a defendant in those lawsuits, but the people involved in the merger, I don't think they practically expected to get much money from me. What they really wanted from me was, because I was the secretary, they wanted me to sign over the, uh, the, the stock certificates in order to complete the merger. They were trying to get specific performance of the merger. But so the, which uh, came first, judicial career or signing over the... <laughs> stock certificates. Well, what, what happened was uh, this, this company was going into a lot of turmoil, and I was thinking I was going to try to wait it out and see if everything would stabilize. And then the finance guys started leaving. And when the finance guys started leaving, I thought, well, now they're the ones that know whether this company is going to survive or not. So I started thinking, well, I think I'll have to go back into private practice. So I started looking a little bit to go back into private practice. And right about then was when this opportunity came up to become a court commissioner. How did it come up? Well, that's a bit of a long story, too. I, uh, I was at lunch one day with a number of uh, guys that I was working with. And one of them pulled out a clipping that he got from the Daily Journal. And the Superior Court was, look, this is back when I was in practice, yeah. uh, looking for court commissioners. And, and it said in there that you had to be admitted to the bar for at least five years in order to be minimally eligible to be a court commissioner. And so he hands it to me and he says, you ought to look into this. I, I can't look into it because I've only been admitted for three or four years, but you've been admitted for more than five years, so you, you could look into it. So I looked at it and then I said, well, you know, court commissioners are generally assigned to do uh, family law and juvenile and that type of thing, and I don't have anything against that, but that's just not really not my career path. It's not what I'm most interested in, so I don't really think it would really be a good career move for me to become a commissioner. And so this buddy of mine that I was having lunch with proceeded to give me this lecture about how that was a really bad attitude, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I should, I should give it a try, and I'll meet some people, and I'll learn a few things. They're never going to offer me the job anyway, 
and it would just be a bit of a learning experience. So after he gave me his lecture, I said, all right, fine, you're, you're, you're right, so I'll, I'll do it. So I took the ad and I called down, I got a copy of the, uh, uh, of the application, and it was a big long application on about 16 inch long paper, and then it folded out twice. So the thing was about four feet long. And I was real busy at the time, so I folded it up, I put it in my desk drawer and basically forgot about it. And it had a, in bold right on the front, it said you have to send it in by a certain date, it won't be considered, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I put it in my drawer and I just turned to other things and I never sent it in. And a couple of weeks went by and a couple of weeks after the deadline went by and I got a call from the Superior Court somebody in the personnel office saying that, well, there's this uh, committee of Superior Court judges that are involved in selecting court commissioners. And they saw my name on some list of people that had received applications. And so they asked to see my application. And the fellow on the phone is telling me and saying, we can't find it. And so I said, well, you can't find it because I never sent it to you. So he says, well, the, will you please send it in? And I said, well, we're way past the deadline. And he said, don't worry about the deadline. Just go ahead and send it in. So I said, all right, I'll think about it. So I thought about it. And being, being younger and a little more naive maybe than I became later, the thought occurred to me that maybe these judges would be upset with me if I didn't send in this form because they specifically asked for it. Now, I realize now today they probably wouldn't have cared. But at the time, I thought, well, I don't want to antagonize anybody. So I filled it out and I sent it in. And then I went through this long process, which was interviews and written tests and oral tests, and, and it was all about things I didn't know much about, family law and juvenile. So we got to the end of the process, and uh, they, they uh, had money to hire 10 commissioners. And so they offered, they, they ranked people in order of preference, apparently, and then they made offers to the first 10, and the first 10 all accepted. And so I wasn't one of those, and so I thought, well, that was an interesting experience, just like my friend said it would be, but that, that's kind of the end of it. And so then I went on about my way, and then a couple of, maybe like about a year and a half or so later, I'm at the oil company, which is starting to come unglued beneath my feet there, thinking oh, I'm going to have to make a move. And the uh, telephone rings, and it's the same fellow from the personnel department down at the Superior Court, and he says, uh, Dave Eagleson wants to talk with me because he wants to appoint me to be a court commissioner. Well, it turned out they ranked every they, they ranked the top 25 people, and, and I was ranked number 11th out of the 25, <laughs> which I thought was pretty good considering that I didn't know anything about family law or juvenile law, and there were about three or 400 applicants. Mm. And so all this time, apparently, I had been number one on that list without knowing it. And when they got some funding to hire a new court commissioner, I'm the next guy on the list. So they. So Dave Eagleson wants to talk with me. So I went down and talked with uh, Dave Eagleson and Harry Peters. Dave, Dave Eagleson was the one who was, was he then pre presiding just right, he judge? Right, he was the PJ at the time, and uh, Harry Peters was the assistant PJ at the time. Well, we should mention that he later went to the Court of Appeal, Division Five, and then to the Supreme Court. Right, yeah. So I talked with uh, Eagleson and, and Petrus, and I made a deal with them that I would uh, become a court commissioner, and they'd assign me to the main downtown courthouse to hear civil cases. And so I thought, well, it sounds like that would be a good learning experience and I'll meet people and get to know some things. And so I kind of mentally said to myself, I'm going to have to make a move anyway. I was thinking of going back into practice. This would be a little detour. I'll do this for about three years and then I'll go back into practice. And then I ended up staying with the court system for 17 years instead of three years. <laughs> so it just goes to show you that you like to think you're planning your life, but really you're reacting to events. I uh, find that very interesting. Um, wh when you came to the Court of Appeal in 1995, right. 1995, uh, you came to Second District Division Two, which is this division right. in this district. And I'll just I'll throw it on the side. I got a phone call from the Chief Justice, the current one, the, who's soon to be retired. Mm -hmm. Uh, who told me that uh, I was a very lucky man and that uh, we were, Division Two was very fortunate to get you. Oh, that was and, nice of uh, him. I just wanted you to know that. I, was, I thought that was a, uh, he didn't do that with everybody that came to me, hmm. to this, this court, so I was happy to learn that. Um, uh, when you came, to the Court of Appeal. Do you remember who your colleagues were then, besides myself, as I was here when you? Oh, came. Mike, Mike, not Mario Fukuda, oh, okay. right? Okay. Yeah. 
and you replaced, I believe, Don Gates. Right. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, while you were here, did one any one of those retire? Do you remember? Morio retired pretty close to the same time I retired. Yeah, just very shortly before you right, retired, that right. he did. And I, I, yeah. I checked on the thing. I'm, I actually checked up on this by <laughs> looking at some things I had. Um, that uh, Candy Cooper was appointed to replace him, and so right, right, yeah. she was listed as being here for at least a month or so uh, while you were here. Right, that's about right. Yeah, would that be about right? And then, do you remember who replaced you when you finally uh, retired from the Court of Appeal? I think it was Kathy Todd. Yes, no, right. she's still here. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, I just kind of wanted to put it into a perspective that mm -hmm. way. I, I wanted to ask you some other questions that relate to your uh, activity here on the Court of Appeal. Um, and I, one, one question I'm going to ask you a little later, but I just, mm -hmm. in case you have a few moments in your brain and you want to multitask, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you about uh, people that in your lifetime mm -hmm. were. Uh, important role models for you or points persons of inspiration or mentors and mm -hmm. that, that's going to be one of the last questions but as you you go through this okay. uh, uh, as I ask some questions you might be also thinking about that uh, the first question I, I wanted to ask you was you had probably uh, over 40 published opinions that you were the author on while mm -hmm. you were here at the Court of Appeal mm -hmm. and that would be a fair amount wouldn't it that's probably. about right I think okay D is there any one or, you know, if it's two or three, it wouldn't matter if you want to do that, that you think are the most significant of the uh, published opinions that you authored? Well, it's always a tricky business to try to uh, pick most significant because it's always depending upon what criteria you're going to apply. And, of course, they're all important to the people who are involved in them. Uh, yeah. Some of them have a little broader impact than, than others do. Uh, I don't know that I could say any was more important than any other. I think probably. Well, I, I'm, I'm thinking yeah. of the broader impact. I, I guess one that had a broader impact was uh, there was an employment case that had to do with whether an employee can sue their supervisor for age discrimination. Would that be Jenkins? That was Jenkins, right. And that was a case that I, I thought had some broad implications. And it was interesting how people looked at that, too, because it really was a situation where you had, had two employees. On, and they were on opposite sides of the issue. One employee was a non-supervisory employee and one employee was a supervisory employee. But the mere fact you had a supervisory employee didn't mean they were a big, powerful corporation. It was still just an individual trying to do their job. And it was interesting how that, that played out in the, uh, in the debate in the bar because a lot of uh, people I saw try, uh, tried to characterize that uh, decision as a uh, pro-business or pro-big corporation kind of a ruling when the real issue there is, is a person who's supervising three or four other people putting their all their assets in their home and everything else on the line when they're trying to do their job. And uh, ultimately that's the way it came out. I mean the Supreme Court ultimately adopted that view and it's been adopted pretty well around the country. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm proud to say that I was one of the people who signed that. Opinion. Right, but you remember, maybe remember we got a lot of grief about that. Yes, when we I do that. remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Morio Fukudo, uh, who yeah. is deceased, was the other so, right. uh, participant on that case. Uh, <clears throat> was there any non-published opinion that you had in your that you have might have in mind that you, you think is worth mentioning, either because it was interesting or because it was significant? And I don't mean to limit that to one if there's more than yeah. one that you want to Well, we had, a, we had a, a lot of interesting cases. I found a lot of the cases to be interesting. Um, having a hard time thinking of any that we decided not, not to publish that uh, were particularly momentous because normally if we thought it was, we would have published it. But Unless it was had such twisted facts. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, and I, and that, that made the well, interest. That, well, that would happen sometimes if, you, if it was so idiosyncratic that it didn't seem to have much application, then we wouldn't, wouldn't publish it. But we had a lot of interesting cases coming through here. Um, any dissents that you authored that uh, may have? I, we all have dissents from time to time, and we still have them uh, from time to time. Is there one that kind of stands out in your mind that, uh, well, where I, you took a stand that was contrary to your colleagues? Well, I remember once we had a case where a... Um, 
you know, thinking about it, we, everybody would voice their opinion, but we would usually come to some consensus, so we didn't have a real high dissent no. rate. But, but we, we would never have, have in this division. But, but we you know, have maybe a couple every year, I guess, maybe. Not, not, sometimes not a lot. there's an agreed dissent. Yeah. You, know. you yes. need one sometimes because right. it's a yeah. cutting issue. But I remember one once where a, uh, th there was a, a, a corporation that had an insurance policy. And then the corporation sold all their assets to a partnership. And then the partnership went on, and it was pretty much bought out by, I think, people who were executives at the corporation, but they sold all their assets to a partnership. And I'm pretty sure that it was some sort of a tax, tax deal to reorganize. To Sometimes if you sell all your assets to a dissimilar entity, you can, for example, bring in a LIFO reserve without paying taxes on it. There are all kinds of things like that that go into it. And it was some kind of a deal like that. So now we ended up with the partnership, which is a different entity. And years go by, and now there's a lawsuit over a diesel fuel line that was leaking. And the corporation is now defunct, but under Supreme Court precedent, you can still sue that defunct corporation. Now, you might say, why would anybody ever want to do that? Well, the only reason they would want to do it is because it had an insurance policy. So you can still sue the defunct corporation and access that insurance policy. But what the plaintiffs in the, in the case at hand did was, instead, they sued, they sued the partnership. And then the partnership tries to get coverage from that policy that sued the corporation, which is still liable to have to respond for the corporation and defend the corporation and pay damages and so forth. And they never and the policy never insured the partnership. And it seemed to me that the only reason why the suit was filed against the partnership instead of the corporation had nothing to do with the merits of anything. What it had to do with is if the corporation had been sued, because the partnership was, the attorneys representing the partnership were trying to get coverage for the partnership. So they sued the insurance company instead of suing the corporation. And I think the reason they did that, if they had sued the corporation, the insurance company would have said, oh, fine, we're going to defend, but you're not the attorney anymore. We're going to put our own attorneys in there now. And they wanted to continue to be the attorney, so they sued the part the the insurance company rather than suing the insured, which was the corporation cross-claiming against them. And uh, I think Milano was on that case, and, and in any event, the... Robert Milano was sitting here as a pro tem at that right. time. He's now the presiding judge right. of Division One. Right, and so he wrote, the, uh, he wrote the majority opinion, and he followed the line of reasoning that uh, is used sometimes in products liability cases, where if you if you're manufacturing a product, but you change the, the business structure of the manufacturing, but the manufacturing goes on un, unimpeded, the liability will follow the way the manufacturing is going, and, the, and there'll be findings that the same insurance policy applies, and so on and so forth. But I found that line of reasoning not, not suitable for this particular situation, because you still had this defunct corporation out there that could be sued. So I wrote a dissent on that, and I, I said I thought that uh, the uh, insurance companies should not have been ordered to provide a defense and indemnity to a party that they never insured, especially because they could still have to defend the corporation when the corporation got sued. But anyway, I was in the minority on that one. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Some other questions. Uh, do you recall who was on your chamber staff while you were here? Well, we had Steve, Steve McCall was my uh, judicial secretary. You brought him over from the Superior Court, didn't you? Right. Yeah. Yeah. He was my clerk on the Superior Court for about 12 years, and then and then I was over here for about a year, and then he came over too. And he, last I looked, he was still here in another division. Right. I think he is still here. Right. Yeah. Uh, might be Division Eight, I think. Or, yes, yeah, Division right. Eight. Right. That's where he is. Yeah. And then, had, uh, and then I had and then I had Rosalind Zakheim was one of my research attorneys. Uh, Mary Lawrence was a research attorney for a while, and then. Then there was some juggling around. I think Mary moved over to work with Mike Knott, and then I got Tim Stone, who was here for a while. Those are the people I recall. Yeah, that's that's who I recall. Yeah. Pretty good. Is there um, an experience or anything that happened while you were a, a Court of Appeal Associate Justice that uh, kind of stands out in your mind if you were kind of just to characterize your your comings and goings during that time? Well, I don't know if I could pinpoint it on one particular experience, but um, 
Well, anytime you do judicial work, you know that your decisions are going to have an impact on people, and it's a quite a responsibility. You have to take it quite seriously, and so that's something you have to think about soberly when you're doing it. And then as you move from the uh, trial court to the court of appeal, now you're not just deciding one particular case, but you're making a decision that can impact on a broad spectrum of people. So it's something you have to remind yourself. It's serious business, and you have to take it seriously and think carefully about it. Do you have a fondest uh, memory of anything in particular from the Court of Appeal? I assume there, there must be some fondest. Well, the, the thing, oh, absolutely. The thing I liked about the Court of Appeal is all of us got along so well. We didn't always agree on everything, but we got along really well. We'd go out every week down to the uh, seafood place down the, mm -hmm. down the street here and have, that, have those great seafood lunches. Yeah. yeah, that was a lot of fun. We still do. Do you? <laughs> Uh, I was going to ask you, is there anything about the way that you, uh, the, the experience that you had here at the Court of Appeal that has kind of stayed with you? Something that, that happened to your way of dealing with things, uh, anything like that? Yeah, I would say so. I think that there were times when uh, <clears throat> you would write something and then you would see how it was being interpreted by other people. And it would teach you a little bit about how to say things so that what you're saying can't be misinterpreted, either deliberately or inadvertently. Because there would be times when uh, I, w I would write something and then I would see how somebody else saw that, e either because maybe I hadn't written it quite as well as I should have or because maybe they're bringing some prejudice to bear on it and I should have written it in such a way as to eliminate that possibility. And so I, I think it teaches you a lot to see how people react to what you're writing and it helps you be more careful how you explain things. Um, if you were to, uh, if you look back at the timing of all of your career from the time you left law school to now, mm -hmm. it looks like it's been 11 years since you were here at the Court of Appeal, I think. It's that, about that's 11 right, years. about 11 years, right. Um, so I, I guess I could say that, and you could say that the, the longest that you've served in any capacity has been uh, in ADR. Would that be correct? Um, well, I think I was on the Superior Court a little bit longer. But, is uh, that long? Yeah. Mm, well, I was on the Superior Court from about 82, oh, yeah. if you, 82 right. to 95. That's, that's yeah. true. Yeah, if, but, you, if you count the uh, right. time as a commissioner and then right. Superior Court judge. Yeah. But I've been doing ADR almost as long as I was on the Superior Court, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, is there... Uh, Something that you remain interested in because of your background in, that's uh, in, in judicial or legal effect that is not in the spectrum of, of business-related uh, activity? You mean some, some area of law? Yeah, any other areas of law that you're interested in. Well, there's one area of law that always interested me was, and this is sort of an inside baseball kind of thing, I guess, but I, I always found inverse condemnation law very interesting. <laughs> and that's, th that's an uh, area in which there's a lot of differences of opinion and confusion, and you're never quite sure what's going to happen on an inverse condemnation case. And it's interesting, too, when you look back into history and, and you see what used to happen before the S Supreme Court developed the inverse condemnation uh, uh, concept. I was reading a, a, a book recently, which is a great book, it's called Rising Tide, and it was about the great Mississippi River flood in 1927. And it's a very interesting book because it tells you all about the science of trying to control the river and the levees and how they tried to maintain the river under control <clears throat> and the problems they have in places like New Orleans and places like that. And, and also it, it tells you a lot about the politics of that time in American history and race relations in the South and how Herbert Hoover came to become president by him, him getting involved in this big disaster that was happening there. But one of the interesting things that was happening was as the water was rising, <clears throat> the city uh, of New Orleans became concerned that the levees would break and the city of New Orleans would be flooded. So with the assistance of army troops, they went to the levee south of the city of New Orleans and they dynamited the levees. And they wiped out a couple of parishes in southern mm -hmm. Louisiana on the theory that that would release the pressure of the water. The water would then go past New Orleans, f flood down, downstream. And they wiped out people's farms and homes, and it was just a major disaster. And uh, the city of New Orleans did it with the assistance of the Army, and there was no compensation. Now, nowadays, that would be an inverse condemnation mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Bob Dylan wrote a song or uh, sung a song more recently as his voice has got older, older and foggier. Mm-hmm. Called if the if the river keeps if it keeps on raining, the levee's going to break. Yeah. In that case, I guess they uh, took care of the rain part by blowing it up. So. Yeah, and they actually had to uh, go, down, go down there with army troops because the local people otherwise were going to try to stop them from blowing up the levees. And, uh, you, you know, we had some cases similar to that here in California after the earthquake in uh, 94, 95. There were some uh, buildings out on the west side of town that were damaged and uh, contained uh, some valuable property like medical records and things like that. And so there were a lot of issues about whether you got to go in there and try to get your... Get your uh, property out of there or whether they, the uh, city could keep you out of the property and tear it down. And they did tear down a lot of buildings. A lot of people lost records and all sorts of things. And then there were arguments about, well, they were, were they really tearing it down because it was a public safety issue or were they tearing it down because it was just the most convenient thing to do at that point rather than, than to have a longer dr- process of letting people remove property. And there were a lot of uh, inverse condemnation cases filed arising out of that. Okay. I, I wanted to ask you a couple of diverse questions. There's the really more matters of interest, but uh, I believe you had two children? Three. Three Three? children, right. Oh, then I (laughs) messed that up. Uh, Tell us how they're doing. Well, the oldest one is uh, just about to graduate. Uh, She she went to undergrad school back east and then went out to Colorado to go to grad school, so she's going to be graduating with a a dual JD and uh, environmental studies degree. Wants to do environmental work of some kind. The uh, 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 my other daughter, who's a couple of years younger, graduated from college with a uh, psychology degree, and she's now working for the Autism Research Institute at the University of Washington in Seattle, and she has in mind to go into a graduate program in psychology at some point. But first, she wants to work for a while and learn a little bit and develop her credentials and so forth. And then my son is in college. He just got back from about nine months uh, overseas. And he's going to be going back to school uh, probably in January, January, February. Okay. Um, hobbies. I know, I, I know particular things that you were interested in. You mentioned a couple of those before we started, but w- would you mind telling us what kind of things you do to uh, vacate your mind, so to speak? Well, unfortunately, recreation. Unfortunately, lately I've been. In fact, it's something I've been thinking about. I've been doing too much work and not enough play, so I've got to start re- uh, resuscitating some of my hobbies. But I like to do things like uh, hiking and bicycle riding and kayaking and, and that, that type of thing. I've gone on a couple of nice hikes recently. I went on a, I guess it was like about a year or so ago with a, a buddy of mine and my son and his girlfriend. We w- went and hiked the uh, West Highland Way through the highlands of Scotland. Hmm. And that was really quite interesting. You meet people along the way, go through these little towns, stay in little bed and breakfast kind of places along the way. No, that was a lot of fun. Besides recreation and, uh, and say, reading and the like, uh, are there other special interests that you have? Well, lately I've been tr- making an effort to try to get back in good physical shape, so I've been trying to exercise some. That's been taking up some time. But uh, I'm, only, I'm only a couple of months into that. I'm making some progress, but I got a little bit out of shape by working too much. I meant to ask you before, we, t- we spoke of Governor Duke Majin, mm-hmm. uh, were you appointed then to the Court of Appeal by a different governor or by Governor Duke Majin? I was appointed to the Court of Appeal by Governor Wilson. I thought so. Yeah. So, uh, if you had to look back on it, what was the most satisfying of all your career? You mean of the different segments uh, of the career? Yeah, all the segments. You look at them, what, what do you think? I mean, now... Uh, other one? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to say, but I, I'll say that I, I found enjoyable parts of each one of them. And the thing I find is that when you, you know, as you go through life, you tend to come to sort of break points where you make a big change from one thing to another. And it, it's fairly hard to do that without having some negatives to it. There's always yes. pluses and minuses. So what you have to hope is that the pluses outweigh the minuses. And I, and I think that as I progress through different stages of my career, that pluses have always outweighed the minuses. But there are things I, I miss about it. I mean, on the trial court, for example, uh, I really thought it was interesting watching a trial develop. I mean, it, it was almost like 
Looks you, like a drama. You, right. If you understand a little bit of the inside baseball, what's going on, watching it develop is just like going to a play or something, and you're mm -hmm. seeing the plot develop and so forth. And I really found that very interesting. Would you mind telling us what you thought were probably the pluses of being a justice on the Court of Appeal? Well, the good thing about being on the Court of Appeal was that uh, you had an opportunity to try to uh, uh, make proper rulings that fit the law that you were dealing with in your particular case into all the rest of the law so that all the law fit together well uh, and so you had a good body of law that would be beneficial to the public. And it took a lot of thought and a lot of uh, breadth of view of what you were dealing with. And if it's done well, I think it really has a great public benefit. And if it's done badly, it can cause problems. Would you have any advice for those who might not even be to the point of seeking a legal career, but if they were thinking about that and also thinking about a judicial career, what they would do along the way to, to uh, have a career as a, an appellate justice? Well, I think probably the first thing I would tell them is that uh, it's not exactly the kind of thing you try to make as your primary objective because it's just so hit and miss and chance and who you meet and who you talk to and what happens and so forth. It's not the kind of thing that you can really plan for in the sense of it's a, it, it's a goal that uh, you can attain just by your own effort. I mean, a lot of it is good fortune and other things have to fall into place. But basically, if you want to become a, uh, an appellate justice, I think then what you need to do is you need to just develop a reputation as somebody that thinks things over, doesn't show any partiality to any particular point of view, but tries to apply the law that, uh, uh, that was created by our democratic process and not try to invent new things or, or fight against something you might not like. I mean, there are a lot of cases where if I had been the emperor, I would have had a different rule of law, but I wasn't, and that wasn't what I could do, and whatever the rule of law was, that's what you apply. What do you think about just the star decisis in general, the idea of precedent in the law? Because it's been developed from English common law. Well, I, I think you have to have a, a fairly strong thread of that because if it's a system of law, then people have to know what the law is. It's not a system of law if nobody knows what it is. It's If, if no, nobody can tell what the law is, that's just a system of somebody being uh, in control and making a decision about it. But uh, the whole idea of law is that people can know what the law is to some degree, some reasonable degree, and then they can try to conform their conduct to the law. They can try to act within the law. So you have to have some stare decisis. On the other hand, we know that sometimes with hindsight benefits of another decade or 15, 20 years goes by, you can see that maybe somebody decided something in a way that was not correct, and once in a while that has to be be changed. But if you do that too much, of course, then you, you erode the whole idea of a system of law. Mm -hmm. So, Well, how, how do you feel about the interplay, especially at the, uh, the appellate level, of the precedential law uh, discernment of some of the forces that are sometimes uh, at work on a particular case that aren't necessarily stated on the cold record and common sense. Any, any thoughts along those lines about how those relate? Well, you get a lot of people criticizing what the legislature does, for example, but on the other hand, I mean, the legislature is generally applying some brand of common sense. They have, a, they have something they're trying to accomplish and you can debate what technique they're using to try to accomplish it, but uh, I think common sense is a, is a good indicator of uh, the meaning of a statute, for example, because people generally don't intentionally create a statute that makes no sense. So common sense does have a, a, a large, uh, it is a large component in your decision making, but on the other hand, you can't use what somebody might think is common sense to rule directly the opposite to what something says. I mean, your first step is to look and see what the language is. Now, if the language is clear, then that, that's the way you apply it. Now, if the language is subject to a little bit of nuance or differing interpretations, all common sense comes in with regard to what was intended by it. My last question that I really have for you, mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean you can't uh, also interject something you think ought to be mentioned here, but was the one that I alluded to earlier, which is uh, in your lifetime, have there been particular role models or mentors or uh, persons of inspiration or ideal that uh, kind of influenced your lifetime and your well, anytime, choices? Well, anytime I, I think of that, the person that always comes to mind is the, the guy that uh, was my athletic coach in starting in junior high school and going on, on from there. And uh, 
I think he, he, uh, I think he just retired recently. He came to coach us when we were like about 12, and he was like 22. He just been out of, just got out of college with his phys ed degree and was sent down to be our coach. So, at the time, of course, he seemed like he was way older than us. Nowadays, it doesn't seem like much because it's only 10 years. But uh, when I go back to Pennsylvania, I still go and visit him. Hmm. And a couple of years ago, uh, a bunch of the guys that are still living back around in, in Pennsylvania there uh, arranged a surprise party for him for his 70th birthday. And so we, we got about 80 or 90 guys back there, and they, and they rented a pavilion at the baseball stadium. Way, it's way out in left field, and it's up pretty high, and there's some seats in front looking out at the field, but then behind there, there's a big area where they have a barbecue uh, set up, and they do all this barbecuing, and, and uh, you have kind of like a picnic kind of a thing up there. So they rented this place and had this big dinner all set up up there, and so we had about 80 guys gathered up there, and he, he was coming to the game with his... Uh, son and, and grandson, and they just told him they were taking him to a baseball game. They didn't tell him that he was going to have 80 of his guys that he had coached waiting there for him. So it was kind of funny because as he comes walking up, he's looking and he sees all these guys standing there, and he comes walking closer, and then he starts recognizing a few people, and so we go up and start shaking his hand and all that sort of thing. And when we give him the microphone, and the first thing he says is, I'm coming to this baseball game, and my son and grandson here are bringing me w way out here to these really lousy seats out in left field. And I'm, thinking, why are we going out to these really lousy seats way out here in left field? The game's not even sold out. Surely there are better seats available. And then I see all these guys standing out there, and I'm wondering, why are all these guys out here near the really lousy seats in left field? <laughs> and we're all there to, of course, to greet him. It was, it was quite, a, uh, you know, quite a tribute to him, I thought. And I thought it was really quite amazing. I mean, there was a guy that uh, had a lot of impact on a lot of young lives o over the years. I was in the first class that he coached, and then, he, of course, he'd been coaching ever since then. And, uh, and uh, a lot of guys that I never even met until I went back to this sort of reunion type of thing. But he well, had a lot of impact on my life. Well, well, what things or characteristics were there that he uh, had that uh, impacted you? Well, he taught you to always do your best, uh, you know, tr try your best, uh, stick with it. If at first you don't succeed, try again. Uh, if you're having a problem with something, figure out how to get around it. Don't blame it on somebody else. Uh, and it was just good, uh, I think, just good... Good uh, advice for yeah. life. Right. Yeah, I really thought so. And, and I, I just thought it was real quite surprising. I mean, a lot of people would say, well, here's a fellow that in a, uh, small, was a small town coach his whole life, but he's got hundreds of people out there that he had a big impact on. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe thousands over 40 or 50 years of coaching. Well, thank you very yeah. much, Jack. I really appreciate it. Is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, well, just that I, I really enjoyed my, uh, my time on the Court of Appeal. If, uh, you know, you never can control exactly how life goes. If it had gone a little differently, I might still be here. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for yeah, coming. Good seeing you, Roger. How long did we...